Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Arthur Quayson and I am Professor of English and Chair of the Department of African and African American Studies at Stanford University. In this episode, we will be discussing Amos Tutuola's My Life in the Bush of Ghosts. Tutuola draws upon Yoruba traditions for his novella. In the Yoruba tradition, the bush or forest is taken to be the domain of extreme uncertainty and trials that form a contrast to the settled communities of villages and towns. The bush was traditionally the place that established the credentials of the hunter, a very important hero figure in Yoruba folklore. Unlike the Yoruba hunter, however, in Tutuola's novella, the seven-year-old boy who gets lost in the bush has no powers to start with and is regularly at the mercy of grisly and grotesque spirits. The story is entirely picaresque and is told from the first-person perspective of the young boy, who is constantly being chased, detained, and also transformed into various animal creatures, and once is even beheaded and his head replaced by another ghost head during his traversal through the bush of ghosts. Unlike in Tutuola's earlier The Palm Wine Drinker, the young boy in the bush of ghosts acquires spiritual power in the spirit world only piecemeal and by virtue of a series of trials, accidents, and coincidences. His is not the quest for a specific boon, but rather a desperate search for a way back home to his family. As we shall see, more important than the quest motif is the way in which the various metamorphoses he undergoes come to define a mode of interspecies ontology in the novella that later offers an important inspiration for the magical realism we find some 40 years later in Ben Oakley's The Famished Road. We must note, to start with, that Tutola's My Life in the Bush of Ghosts does not, strictly speaking, qualify to be described as a magical realist text. This is because, as we saw in last week's episode defining the term, magical realism is a mode of writing that establishes a scrupulous equivalence between the fantastic and the real. Thus, Fantastic moments in the text must not evince surprise and startlement from the characters and must also appear as plausible as the more realistic details. This is not what we see in Tutuola's novella, where at every turn the lost boy in the bush of ghosts expresses surprise, both at the grotesque nature of the various ghosts he encounters and also at the various metamorphoses that he is made to undergo. Furthermore, the boy's entry into the world of spirits is clearly demarcated through an entry and an exit portal. The entry portal occurs early in the first few pages of the novella. The boy's village is beset by a war and having been orphaned, he and his brother are separated. He takes shelter under a fruit tree, but as the sound of gunfire draws ever closer, he enters the bush under a sign under the fruit tree that says, the future sign. His bewildering adventures start from there. The exit portal is even more peculiar. Toward the end of the story, he encounters a television handed ghostess who literally has a television monitor as part of her right palm. When she opens her hand to him, 
he sees his long lost brother who has now become a prosperous merchant. The boy is desperate to get home to his brother, but to do so, he has to pass a test set by the television handed ghosts. And it's only after he passes the test that she finally opens her hand for him to pass through the television portal and get home. These portals distort any equivalence that might have obtained between the fantastic and the real, thus also decisively rendering the novella not a magical realist text. Among the Yoruba, cautionary tales told to children often draw on the traditional travel and quest narratives built on the experiences of hunters in the bush. This idea of the bush being the location of otherness and danger is reinforced by stories that circulate among the Yoruba about the hunters' encounters with strange creatures on their hunting expeditions. The fascinating thing about Tutole's handling of these materials is that he also brings together a whole range of oral genres such as riddles, proverbs, enigmas and puzzles, etymological tales, and even songs and refrains, so that his narratives become concatenations of several elements from Yoruba storytelling traditions, and thus cannot be easily limited to one mood or genre. In an article on Achebe's evil forest, Ainehe Edoro Guinness, 2018, argues persuasively that in African literature, the bush or forest is the antithesis of settled communities and is conceived of as the problematic non-civilized space that harbors all sorts of counter-societal forces, but that are dialectically related to the formation of the idea of settlement and civilization. She gives several examples of this dialectical relationship in African literature, and my life in the bush of ghosts falls firmly within her scheme. However, despite it not being a magical realist text, my life in the bush of ghosts is useful as a precursor to African magical realism in terms of various features such as the blurring of the boundaries between the human, the animal, and the natural worlds. We also see the animation of space in such a way as to lend it sentient human qualities. These features introduce a dimension of interspecies ontology that is very useful for grasping some of the central features of magical realism in general, and is especially useful for understanding the magical realism of fellow African writers, such as the British Nigerian Ben Okri, the South African Lorraine Buex, and the Angolan Pepetela, among various others. In my life in the bush of ghosts, space is essentially anamorphic. As we noted in our episode on geometries of space and time, in science fiction and fantasy, anamorphism simply means the distortion of spatiotemporal form. Typically, in science fiction, anamorphism is most readily seen in the distortions of space-time coordinates, such that an innocent-looking door in a bedroom when first opened, might reveal the entire twinkling galaxy. Closed and opened again, it might reveal a bustling street in Paris. And if closed and opened again, only the cat yawning under a leafy mango tree in the backyard. The point is that space and time are not entirely predictable and that there are wrinkles in space-time that either lead to unpredictable connections between different dimensions or, as is also common, the different texturization of space and time. Time might also become viscous or taken the form of sudden sentience. This is what we see in movies such as The Matrix, Doctor Strange, Inception, 
and interstellar, and in fantasy novels such as Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, and Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials Trilogy, among various others. In my life in the Bush of Ghosts, the most explicit expression of spatial anamorphism occurs in a story segment where the young boy is desperately trying to escape the attentions of some ghosts intent on capturing him, and he runs into another section of the bush. This is what we see. But to my surprise, at the same moment that I put my left foot on it to be still running away, it was saying this with a loud voice. Don't smash me. Oh, don't smash me. Don't walk on me. Go back to those who are chasing you to kill you. It is paining me too much as you are smashing me. When I heard this so suddenly, I was so frightened that I withdrew my foot back at once and I heard no voice again. After that, I turned to another part and smashed it again with the same foot as well. Perhaps that part would not cry, but I heard the same caution suddenly with louder voice, so I withdrew my foot from it. Then I stopped there and asked myself this question. Can land talk like a human being, or can land feel pain if somebody smashes it? The uncanny experience persists when on continuing to run through that patch of ground, the voice of the earth is replaced with that of a very loud siren or blowing alarm, as we are told in the story. But the question that the young boy asks about whether the earth can feel what is done to it is very important because not only are we exposed to the possibility that the earth does indeed feel pain and protest against it, but that the young boy acquires awareness about precisely this possibility. This is one of the installments of the interspecies ontologies that Tutola gives us. Another dimension of interspecies ontology in the story is shown in the many metamorphoses that the boy is forced to undergo. Typically, these metamorphoses are tied to being placed in different forms of bondage by the grotesque ghosts that he encounters during his passage through the bush. In an early adventure, the boy is transformed into a horse and then into a cow. And in each instance, he strives to prove to his captives that he is not an animal, but a human being trapped in an animal's body. For example, while in the shape of a cow, he refuses to do what cows do and is punished by them for it. More importantly, when the humans, ghosts really, are having a conversation, he stands close to them, nodding and shaking his head to acknowledge various points in their conversation. But whenever he opens his mouth to speak, it only comes out as animal talk and is completely incomprehensible to them. The issue here seems to be related to the question of how animals might signify in their sentience through a language that humans are incapable of recognizing. At another point, a bunch of ghosts carry him to the ninth town of ghosts, change him into a blind man, and after torturing him a while, lock him up in a doorless room. This doorless room happens to be filled with a thousand snakes, the largest of which vomits some colored lights that light up all parts of the room. This slimy, tactile, and horror-filled space then turns into a complete anamorphic threshold. The snakes disappear, and immediately after that, 
he sees that the doorless room has changed into a picture and that he is unexpectedly inside of the picture. Simultaneously, his neck elongates to about three feet long and his head becomes so big that his long neck can barely carry it. Two large eyes that are as big and round as footballs appear on each side of this head and both eyes can easily turn in any direction. In addition, he sprouts wings and a long beak. The boy has become a bird with a pitcher for his body. Things become even more strange when the ghosts mistake him for a god and offer him sacrifices of food. Unfortunately, however, any time he tries to eat the food, his beak shrinks so that he can only peck at it. Several things have taken place in this story segment. To start with, the room with the snakes in which he is held captive is thoroughly anamorphic because the snakes vanish only for the space itself to transform into a picture and trap him in it. This picture transformation itself points to the fact that he is not only a captive, but also seriously mobility impaired. He is a victim of a particular kind of constrained embodiment. Secondly, while trapped in the picture, he is also transformed into a strange feathered bird with a long neck a large head, two large eyes, and a changeable beak. This marks his transformation into a god, worshipped both by the denizens of the ninth town of ghosts, as well as ghosts from far and wide that come to see this strange sight. Given that every ghost encounters in the bush is a grotesque and strange figure, this can only mean that his composite nature comprising the head and feathers of a bird and the body of a man-made picture makes him more anomalous than any of the other spirit ghosts and thus, ironically, the object of their reverence. We wouldn't be going too far in seeing this God in the Picture segment as illustrative of Tutola's reflection on ontological states, something that is featured repeatedly within the narrative. For here, he is reflecting on the nature of divine being and suggesting that the divine may itself be eager to escape its own divinity so as to satisfy some basic and indeed banal human-like needs. The ghosts that come to worship what they take to be a divine being are clearly mistaken since it is only its extraordinary interspecies anomalousness that elevates it above all the other creatures and not the fact that it possesses any special divine qualities. Most readers of my life in the bush of ghosts have been charmed by its grammatically challenged English and its quaint accounts of grotesque ghosts and spirits. Tutuola was born in 1920, but only started school at the age of 12. He proceeded to high school, but unable to complete his education after the death of his father when he was 19, he learned blacksmithing and joined the Royal Air Force in Nigeria as a blacksmith. It was while working later as a messenger in the Nigerian Department of Labor that he started writing simply to relieve himself of unbearable boredom. And yet, on closer examination, Tutola predates debates on interspecies ontologies by several decades. For he asks some very profound questions through his picaresque stories. Among them, what might it look like if the earth could express pain? Do sentient beings, such as animals, share humans' desire for linguistic comprehension? And what is the true ontological status of a god, any god? Are they the products of profound human necessity for some sense of the divine, or simply the entrapped embodiment 
of human desires for the supernatural? None of these questions have straightforward answers. But to even begin to understand the nature of the questions being asked, we have to pay attention to the specific form of the stories in which they are posed. Thank you. Please remember to check out the suggested readings in the episode's description. And if you like this episode, give a thumbs up, subscribe and share, hit the notifications bell so that you do not miss out on any upcoming episodes and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.